friends uh, we're going to start uh, this instruction course uh, on uh, principles and pearls in the management uh, surgical management of complex retinal detachments and uh, we are, we're going to uh, straight away uh, start with the first talk and the first talk uh, is to be given by delivered by uh, dr lingam gopal uh, because he has a uh, talk in the another hall uh, subsequently uh, so he's going to uh, talk to us on management of retinal detachment with a choroidal coloboma uh, dr lingam gopal please for having introduced me in this uh, or having included me in his instructional course and my apologies that I had to prepone my talk because of the second commitment this is about the surgical management of detachments of retina with coloboma of choroid for some reason in India we seem to see, see this condition pretty commonly compared to the western literature where they see it very occasionally and go to go straight to the management of retinal detachments we need to understand the anatomy of the coloboma and what causes the detachment related to the coloboma. Again, for this, I would refer you to the article by Dr. Schubert, wherein he has described beautifully that the retina, as it goes towards the coloboma, splits actually into two layers. The inner layer continues as the intracalary membrane, which is a fibrotic membrane that covers the coloboma, while the outer layer turns backwards and then merges with the retinal pigment epithelium. And it is this junction which has been called as the area of the least resistance. And this is the area which has to communicate with the sub-ICM space for it to cause a retinal detachment clinically. You can see on the OCT as well that this is the retina, normal thickness, and inner layers are continuing as the uh, fibrotic intracalary membrane beyond the coloboma margin. But the outer layers are actually turning back and joining the retinal pigment epithelium. And histopathologically, sometimes you can actually see a double layer of photoreceptors at this point because there's one layer here, another layer which has turned back. And we also have described some breaks in the intracalary membrane, not that they are important from the management point of view, but it gives you a perspective how difficult it is to identify these breaks against the backdrop of a lack of retinal pigment epithelium. But it also gives you an understanding that you need a break in the intracalary membrane as well for a clinical retinal detachment to take place in addition to the break at the area of least resistance. So we found that there can be breaks right here in the middle of the intracalary membrane within the coloboma. It can be multiple breaks or as in this case, there are three breaks or you can find a break right at the edge of the coloboma where only one edge of the intracalary membrane break is actually lifted. That is this edge. While the second edge is actually merging with the coloboma floor or it can be at the area of the Macular, macula, which is involved in the coloboma. You know this is macula because it's surrounded by the area of the uh, lowest pigmentation of macula lutea. So the variables in an eye with coloboma are one is the peripheral retinal break, which may be there, may not be there, but you need a break in the intracalary membrane and a break in the area of least resistance for the coloboma itself to be responsible for the retinal detachment. So if you have only peripheral break, it's as good as any other eye without coloboma and RD involves the normal retina, doesn't encroach within the colobomatous area, and there's no ICM detachment, and the management is as a routine. But before we manage it as a routine, we must be sure that there is really no intracalary membrane detachment. A small area of detachment at the margin can be easily missed in a microphthalmic eye with nystagmus. So if there's only ICM break, which is the other end of the spectrum, then you get only an ICM detachment, like in this case. The ICM detachment doesn't spill over to the normal retina because there's no communication between the sub-ICM space and the subretinal space at the junction, the junction of the least resistance. So in these cases, a prophylactic laser along the coloboma margin will probably be useful to prevent this from spilling into the uh, subretinal space later on. But when you have a break at the locus manaris resistance with ICM break, with or without a peripheral break, this is exactly what leads to a clinical detachment of retina with which the patient comes to you. Then the retina is detached, there's also an ICM detachment and they both are communicating with each other and their communication of subretinal space and sub-ICM space is through 
a break at the locus minoris, resistance sheet. But the break in the ICM is not easily demonstrable, and the break at the area of least resistance is never demonstrable clinically, except by OCT. The other variables are the size of the eyeball could be very small, the lens can be opaque partly or completely, there's coloboma of the iris, and the disc could be involved in coloboma to a variable degree, and macula also could be involved in the coloboma, and there could be also PVR as well. In addition, you find that the ICM itself could be taut and could be a cause for the retina being lifted up at the margin of the coloboma. The detachment at the coloboma margin could also be chronic because very often the PVTS did not detach and the traction is what leads to the repeated occurrences of RPE disturbance and uh, demarcation lines. A more rapid spread occurs once there is some amount of liquid which is available for the retina to detach. You can identify the site of communication between subretinal space and the sub ICM space by OCT. As you can see in this section, which is at this point, you can see the communication. But in the same eye, another section at this point, which is just beyond, we don't see the communication at all. This is again showing the sub ICM space communicating with the subretinal space. So eyes with only peripheral retinal detachment and no ICM detachment, you manage routinely, ignoring the coloboma. While when you are up to do a vitrectomy, you must understand that the location of sclerotomies would vary depending upon the degree of microphthalmia. You may, have to, you may have to sacrifice the lens in a few cases, even if the lens is clear, because of the eyeball being so small, the lens being correspondingly large. Questionable role of encephalage, especially in an eye with a large coloboma extending almost through about to have four o'clock hours. What is encephalage doing? Really nothing, because the inferior part doesn't need any support. There's no retina there, and the part of the retina which needs support is all superiorly located. A vitrectomy with the debulking of the vitreous base is, for, is the same as for any other vitrectomy approach for a retinal detachment. You induce PVD, and this could be traumatic to the area of least resistance, and hence you can actually induce more communications between subretinal space and the sub ACM space than what they were to start with. And hence, we try to treat the entire coloboma on the table and not restrict the treatment to the area of what was originally seen as a communication between the two spaces. So if, there's, if you do fluid gas exchange with removal of the vitreous fluid alone from the optic disc or colobometer's floor, you find different behaviors in the, the three situations. If you have only peripheral break, the detachment balloons around the coloboma, but there's no communication between the subretinal space and the vitreous cavity. There's no flattening of retina taking place and no spread into the ICM area. But if you have a peripheral break and a break in the area of least resistance, the fluid is pushed to the posterior pole, but is also pushed into the coloboma because there's a communication at subretinal space and sub ICM space level. But again, it doesn't flatten. But when you have a break at all the three points, you find the retina flattens automatically without any effort because the fluid is able to be pushed from subretinal space into sub ICM space and into the vitreous cavity. Once you flatten the retina, you treat the coloboma margin with two to three rows. I prefer a diode laser because it doesn't have a risk of burning the nerve fiber layer accidentally, especially in those eyes where the disc is involved in the coloboma. And it's important to treat up to the ora serrata. But sometimes the macula may be just outside the coloboma margin. So if you go across that coloboma margin, you run a risk of destroying the macula. Then you'd probably skirt the macula, means leave about 100, 200 microns away on either side of the macula untreated, taking a risk that if you remove the oil also, the retina may remain attached. Silicon oil is preferred in most cases because of the large area of the coloboma margin that needs to be tamponaded. But gas may be okay in ice where there's a localized detachment in one quadrant and there's a localized ICM detachment and there was easy PVD induction. For a period of time, we have accumulated enough experience to tell that this approach is very successful in reattaching a retina, especially in those eyes which did not come to you with PVR and a contracted retina. You can have, this is the initial series which showed about 81% success with 70% having functional vision. And later on, we accumulated a few more K cases between 98 and 2006, which showed almost a 95% success because we also improve our techniques. We are better at doing what we are doing all along, and a large number of people have got good navigational vision. So in conclusion, colobomas are a special situation with a high incidence of detachment of retina in the lifetime of the individual. The pattern of breaks is unconventional, and one need to understand the pathogenesis of the detachment related to the coloboma itself. Parsplenal vitrectomy with silicon oil gives us a very good success rate with satisfying surgical and 
a visual success. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Lingam Gopal, for uh, giving us uh, the tips uh, how we can handle such a difficult situation. Uh, are there any questions to Dr. Gopal? Yeah, since years we are doing the prophylactic barrage of the coloboma with the ICM detached or attached. I just want to know that uh, 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 what are the failures or, or, or how many cases uh, of failures you have seen in your past of barraged cases or barraged coloboma that in those cases in spite of uh, being barraged uh, they have progressed to the RD. Team barrage laser because I believe that uh, treating an attached retina in an eye with an optic disc involved in the coloboma is always risky. When, unlike reattaching the retina on the table, there's always a thin film of fluid to protect you from the nerve fiber layer. So I treat without hesitation when the disc is outside the coloboma, because there's no risk involved. And if the disc is involved and if the ICM is detached, then I go very gently in the area of the disc coloboma. If I able to do with a slit clamp delivery, I have more control of the intensity of the burn. While with in indirect laser delivery, I have less control. So I'm a little hesitant to treat unless the child is a little grown up and I'm able to put on a lens and see and slit clamp very carefully. Because you should understand at the end of the day, you're trying to protect the eye and you don't want to destroy the nerve fiber layer by accident. And I have not had that many series followed up for that long a period to tell you whether after coloboma barrage did I have a recurrence, a recurrence of detachment or not. I have, I have not had any, frankly. But that doesn't answer your question that what is the incidence rate? Because I don't have that much of a follow-up to answer your question. Like uh, if a patient uh, is having a detachment with a coloboma, in the other eye, I think it is mandatory to go, to go, go for a barrage laser. But uh, many of the patients that we have seen, we are following up young patients, uh, even uh, they're 15, 16 years of age, having a coloboma. So you're not recommending uh, to do laser, right? No, no I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not against is doing laser. I do believe that that is the cause of detachment and definitely if you're able to do a safe laser, it's okay. But suppose you get a five-year-old child with one eye detachment. Trying to treat other eye under indirect laser under GA is to me far unsafe. Because around the disc when you go around, I have had at least one patient where we were using a green laser and we were not able to titrate the bun properly intraoperatively. And around the disc margin when we treated, the patient had perfectly attached retina, but, but only PLPR vision. Mm -hmm. The reason was the burns were too, too dense and the actual nerve fiber layer damage occurred. So I'm always concerned about that, especially in a dry macula, dry retina, where you produce a burn, there's always a risk that you can actually mm -hmm. spread full thickness. Mm -hmm. But if you're careful and if you're sure that you're not able to get a full, mm -hmm. you're not getting a full thickness burn, perfectly fine. Go ahead and do but it. as a take home message, should we routinely treat cases yeah. where there is only, See, there's the no reason, detachment The reason the for the caveat, is I think it's always important that yes, you treat, you get good, good result. But if you treat badly, you get a very bad result right in the beginning. So it's important to know the caveats before you actually treat, rather than trying to treat everybody. You know, they think, okay, every case of uh, colobomas, I'll do prophylactic laser, and you may end up with at least five or 10 percent having a problem. That also is a serious problem. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Uh, I, have a, I have a question that's related to that. Uh, for the ICM detachment, do you believe totally on clinical or you have a lot of work on OCT? So if something is picked up on OCT, better than clinically? If you want uh, ICM detachment is fairly easily detected clinically yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. But if you want, but what is not detected is the, at the edge of coloboma, a small narrow margin of ICM detachment, that is not detected easily clinically. That's what I'm saying. If you f yes. f find there that I narrow margin, you want prophylactic OCT, laser yes. there. I rely on OCT. Yeah. But having said that, there are always eyes where you cannot even do OCT unless you have a handheld OCT. A small child who doesn't permit you to do OCT, small microphthalmic with a severe nystagmus, you have difficulty. So under GA, sometimes you, you, if you have a handheld OCT, do it. Otherwise, you go in and then judge yourself if there's the same detachment or not. Yeah. Thank, you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Gupal, for uh, highlighting all the points and uh, uh, especially in a subject where uh, I think he has a talk in the other hall. So we move on to the next talk uh, uh, by Dr. Vishali Gupta, Management of Combined uh, Retinal Detachment.
Thank you, sir. I'll be talking uh, about some tips regarding the management of combined. The word combined essentially means that you have a tractional RD on top of which you had a rigmatogenous component added and this accounts for about 7 to 35 percent of all cases who undergo vitrectomy for diabetes. Now before we actually move on to the surgery, <coughs> The pre-op counseling is extremely important. Firstly, it's very important to explain to the patient not to have unrealistic expectations. Because prognosis as far as vitrectomy is concerned is best for vitreous hemorrhage followed by TRD and worse for the combined form of detachment. There is a risk of no light perception in 10 to 12 percent of the patients after surgery. So you need to have a very good informed written consent. It's important to plan preoperatively pan-retinal photocoagulation in whichever area of the retina is visible during the pre-op period. One of the problems which we all encounter during surgery for diabetics is intraocular hemorrhage. So intraocular hemorrhage sometimes can be so severe that it is difficult to control and there are two pre-op measures which we can do to prevent it. One, a good pan-retinal photocoagulation and second, preoperative injection of anti-VEGF injection. Besides the laser photocoagulation, it is important that the patient has a good metabolic systemic control because the good control will ensure you don't have too much fibrin formation uh, during the surgery and it also helps in intraoperative control of blood pressure. Now I'll show you some of the examples. For example, this is a case. You have this detachment, you, you have these fibrovascular fronts and you can see there is a convexity here because it has developed a hole and there is now combined retinal detachment. So he needs PPV now for the combined detachment and has not undergone any pan-retinal photocoagulation. But you also understand in presence of these fronts, they are likely to bleed the moment you try to peel off these membranes. This is the same patient receives anti-VEGF injection. You can see these fronts are less uh, angry looking now, undergoes surgery after the vitrectomy. So you can see this is gas and this is uh, five months later and the vision has improved because his fovea is not involved. This is another, another example with very tight fibrovascular adhesions without any vitreoretinal separation. Now this is again going to lead to unstoppable ble bleeding, tears and you know many of these eyes before VEGF we used to abandon surgeries because there used to be so much intraoperative hemorrhage that we could not control. But the same patient look at the regression of the fronts following pre-op injection this is before surgery and this is after surgery. And the surgery consisted of hyaloid separation with delamination and there was no tear or break. Another example before Evastin, you can see this. This is one day patient undergoes surgery and this is post six months follow up. The vision has improved to 20 hundred. Now, Besides getting a good metabolic control, good uh, preoperative anti-VEGF, there are two components which we need to talk about combined detachment. One is there is a fibrovascular proliferation and secondly, there is a retinal break. It's important to know that the breaks may be slit-like and covered with fibrovascular proliferation. So you may miss a break but the moment you see corrugations or convexity in a patient with tractional detachment suspect a break somewhere. The retinal detachment may or may not reach aura and if too much active new vascularization, I already highlighted that pre-op anti-vegetal. 
The surgical principles are very uh, simple. Remove axial vitreous opacities, including hemorrhage. Release anterior posterior and tangential traction. Remove epiretinal membranes and posterior hyaloid membranes. Control bleeding. And if it has not been lasered, do a good PRP after surgery. And you will have results like pre and post-op. Pre and post-op and pre and post-op. What is the key to success? The key to success is tissue separation. The only important thing is that you identify the plane of dissection. If you are able to identify the plane of dissection through which your instruments go, that is the best, half the battle is already won. I'm not going to go into a lot of details of these techniques. Uh, there are different techniques by which you separate these fibrovascular membranes from the underlying retina. That can include segmentation, delamination. You can use multiple instruments. But these days with the uh, visco dissection was never so much popular. But what I'm going to show you is that these days with the instruments that are available to us, the cutters, the 27 gauge, Actually, the only thing you need is just a good cutter. If you have constellation, proportional reflex, and you are able to do most of the dissection. With this, I'm going to show you one short video of such surgery. Now, this is the patient who's undergoing 25G pars plena vitrectomy. So you can see, first we do the core vitrectomy to remove the vitreous. Now, this is the point which is important. You have to find the plane of dissection. If you are able to find this plane through which you are going to separate the membrane from the retina, your surgery becomes very easy. Because if your plane is not right, you will end up creating iatrogenic breaks. So, you can see uh, we are going step by step separating the tissue from the retina and then cutting it along with. So most of the times these days uh, for the surgeries we really do not need multiple instruments because the tip of the cutter is so close to this that it acts like a scissor, it acts uh, you, you know, it acts like MCP and this is the proportional reflux where you can introduce a guarded amount of the fluid to separate this tissue from the retina. You separate it before you start cutting it. So what is important is many a times some of these patients, rather quite a few of them, are going to have uh, vitreous schesis. So it is important that once you have done a dissection of the membranes, inject canacot, look for any residual vitreous, complete the dissection, and then go into the periphery to cut off the peripheral skirt of the vitreous. Don't cut the peripheral vitreous in the beginning because at that time it might become difficult to uh, separate the dissection because the peripheral vitreous kind of holds it like a tent. So it's a good idea to do dissection first in the posterior pole and then into. This is just another. Uh, So to conclude, uh, for combined detachments, preoperative counseling, a good laser, anti-VEGF, and meticulous tissue separation is the key to success. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Vishali, for uh, giving tips how we can handle the most difficult situation of combined detachment, especially your newer concept of reflux, uh, uh, using a reflux mode and then uh, cutting uh, most of the surgery or doing most of the surgery. Uh, so uh, now uh, this is open for the discussion as well as any uh, questions or uh, you have any other. Uh
uh, attached with the first surgery. There's a redetachment, which has occurred. And because of extensive fibrosis, fibrosis PVR changes, and there's a TRD component as well. So, uh, and there's a silicon oil in situ. So what is your approach in that situation? We, uh, I would personally first remove the silicon oil and then do the surgery as a naive patient, stain it, remove the membranes meticulously. There is recently now in US especially, they are injecting intravitreal methotrexate at the end of the surgery to prev uh, for the bad PVR cases and for diabetic TRDs where they are developing wet current fibrovascular membranes. Uh, I have done it, but in Boston, like MIT, they are injecting it every monthly for the six months, even through the oil. It's not published as yet, but their data is ready. I have not personally done it post, but at the end of the surgery, yes. Uh, only thing you have to be careful is when you are doing methotrexate, sometimes the laser uptake is not so good because it prevents the fibrosis. So that is one little bit. You may have to do more laser. But other than that, for the resurgeries, I will do, I will be more meticulous and maybe inject once I have done the uh, triumphs alone, remove the membranes, even inject the trypan blue because it might show you small little plaques of the vitreous the idea of tripon blue is not essentially to peel off the entire ILM, but it is just to see any residual plaques of the vitreous or some stasis membranes which we might be able to identify and peel. With Ingenuity now, we have different filters. You can change over the filters. They give you different colors to see whether you have been thorough with the membrane peel. Uh, Ma'am, I have a uh, you know, question here. I mean, is there any... Uh, precautions we should tell them before injecting intravitreal into the eye in a combined RD case? Yes, it is very important. <coughs> Never inject intravitreal injection till you are very sure that you are going to take up the patient for surgery because <coughs> they are all sick patients. So don't inject and then not get the clearance for surgery because then they will proliferate very fast. So give injection only when you are very sure that patient has all the clearances and ready to be taken up for surgery. I think that's a very important point uh, for anybody taking up these cases. I think injection uh, sometimes is a challenge when we give pre-op uh, anti-VEGF uh, because uh, we don't know whether it's going to crunch up the whole retina and your surgery becomes more difficult. And uh, the best is uh, as uh, Dr. Vishali mentioned that get all the clearances and perhaps this is one situation where we like to operate uh, within two days most of the time. Yeah. Uh, we usually schedule the injection that way. We don't wait here because uh, uh, if you have contracted retina it's going to be a real problem and sometimes uh, it may be a real challenge to uh, manage such a situation. So that's a very very uh, relevant question as well as we need to keep that all the time in mind. Other uh, cases, most of the time, we usually say maybe we can do down the line in a week's time or 10 days even. So uh, that part is uh, very, very essential. And uh, regarding what uh, uh, Dr. Vishali said about uh, uh, question which was regarding the re-retinal -ret detachment, I think uh, it's both ways. Uh, some may feel more comfortable removing uh, these membrane under the oil if your visibility is good uh, sometimes it does help you uh, some sort of way it gives a little tamponade effect and you can remove them much more easily and see them also uh, more easily because the retina doesn't become floppy and uh, it does help in certain cases but it's both ways if you are not able to do then uh, perhaps you have to partly do this way and then remove because most of the time may, retina may become uh, more mobile and you have more difficulties. And especially in a diabetic case, the biggest issue is perhaps in such a case, maybe we are not uh, earlier surgery from where the case came or if it was our own case, uh, maybe a hyaloid issue that it has not removed. So it can be in a thin retina, a real challenge at times. So it's not that easy, especially in a diabetic thin retina. Uh, Yes. 
can come. We have plenty of time under the for discussion yeah. and uh, uh, yeah. Under the oil, will the proportional reflux system work? No, no. It will not no. work. No, and there's a risk of, uh, if there's a break, uh, there's a risk no, of No, what oil. sir is suggesting is like we do membrane peeling and all under the oil. So if you have too many epiretinal membranes, first you can remove under the oil and then if you want to do staining or something, maybe you can remove the oil and complete the surgery. You can do You that. have to definitely remove the oil later and complete the surgery as well as what Professor Rashali mentioned, we use these days dyes because that uh, give us idea of additional membranes. Maybe sometime even if residual uh, sticky things are there, you use trimsilinone. So you have to just try everything, whatever possible. But how about the canning the risk of uh, the oil going through a fresh break again, you know, like... I think most of the time, if that is happening, definitely you have to be more aggressive. Then we come to uh, doing either a retinectomy or a retinotomy, because in such a situation, you don't want to leave that retina, which is some shot, uh, already shot. Uh, that is where we have a problem. Even otherwise, uh, many a times, like uh, what we do, and uh, at least my own preference is that all cases, uh, wherever uh, we use PFCL uh, for surgery, uh, I don't do direct exchange. Uh, I tend to do uh, exchange with the uh, air fluid yeah. exchange. Because the idea is you immediately know that if it is going behind, that means you still have a retina which is still stiff and so that helps uh, in many situations. So, but then you know how uh, the vitreous surgery is, there are always different ways of doing uh, those things. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, well, hello, yeah. While operating, um, there's a bleeder uh, temporal to fovea, then uh, how do we deal with it? Like uh, we, we cannot diathermize if it's very close to the fovea. Uh, go on a high tamponade, okay. 60 millimeter. This is like, I work with constellation, so I'm only aware. You, so you press the foot switch, your intraocular tamponade comes. The maximum duration for which you can keep is two minutes. But generally within 30, 40 seconds, you are able to control that bleeding, and then you bring it back to uh, normal pressure. Okay. And so no intraocular tamponade. That's the only way. And yeah. uh, you won't, uh, till how much distance from the fovea do you prefer, or can you uh, recommend uh, using a diathermy? Like how close sh should we not uh, I think diathermy would depend on the bleeder. Okay. But anything because if it's a very fibrovascular and thick bleed, like uh, in that case, uh, how close can we go to the fovea? You know what? In practical situations, what happens is the bleeding comes from the fibrovascular proliferation which is covering the fovea, okay? okay. So when you have found the right plane, okay. you are going under that and you are cutting those blood vessels. Okay. They do bleed little when you are cutting them, but once you have cut that membrane, there is no bleeding. Okay. What you are saying is the bleeding from the retinal tissue the little bit of capillary ooze or something. That capillary ooze per se, you don't need to diathermize. You can control it with intraocular tamponade. But still, if there is a retinal bleeder, which needs to be tackled, if you look at the anatomy of the fovea, within 800 microns anyways, you don't have large vessels. So you're not going to have a large bleeder very close to the fovea. The bleeder which is going to bleed is anyways going to be okay. away, which you can safely. Uh, okay. And ma'am, while dealing with the TRD, like uh, when, uh, suppose an itrogenic break when it forms, then it's actually very difficult because there's a thick, suppose there was a thick uh, fibrovascular membrane and while trying to peel it, a break happened. After that, how to deal with it? Because... Uh, if the break happens in a tractional retinal detachment, it has to be treated as combined retinal detachment. Yeah which means you do the complete dissection, including the peripheral vitreous dissection, make sure all the membranes are peeled because this is the patient now which is going to require in tamponade and drainage. Okay. So that way you have to treat. And sometimes when you have a break in the tractional, the retina becomes mobile and it becomes very difficult to separate the membrane from the retina. Yeah. It's a good idea to start it at a place where retina is still attached and gradually work your ways towards the area where the retina is become mobile. Because if you go from the mobile to the less mobile retina, you will 
I have this retina jumping into your tissue. Go on a shape mode with very high cut rate, very low suction so that your cutter is actually like a razor. It's kind of just cutting it uh, very close. Ma'am, sometimes during the surgery, there becomes like after bleeding, there is a clot which is very sticky to the retina and it's very difficult to take it out. So how do you manage that clot? Because that clot comes because of the fibrin and fibrin comes because of uncontrolled diabetes. And fibrin has that kind of glue to it. So it kind of sticks onto the retina. So if you do too much of maneuver to pull it, you might pull the retina which is detached along with it. So the first step is a good metabolic control. The second step is good pan-retinal photocoagulation. And the third step is uh, if you have this, don't wait for the clot to form. So what you can do is take care of the bleeder by increasing the tamponade. While your tamponade is high, identify the bleeder, diathermize it, don't allow the blood to be accumulated there. If you have a little blood of uh, blood, I go on the uh, reflux mode. So you use the reflux or back flush or this to dislodge it and comfortably remove it. But don't try to be too aggressive trying to pull it out. Ma'am, sometimes what happens is that beneath the clot, you know that, that there is a retinal break then it's very difficult to take the clot out, clot out and it's also essential to laser that break. So what to do in such situations? Uh, clot is in the break? Yeah, clot is over the retina and you know that the underlying retina is having a break and it's very difficult to take the clot out I, once I, it's I would go. I would go with the suction and the back flush. Try to dislodge, it takes time, but you keep on doing it gradually Keep on teasing it from the edges and keep on aspirating it till the time clot becomes small. Even if you are not able to identify precisely the break, you can uh, laser the area which is around it. And many a times after the fluid gas exchange in silicon oil, it becomes actually simple and some of these patients in extreme situations, even after the oil when your retina gets flattened, you can put few laser spots at that point also. Okay. Uh, I think one, uh, one of the things which you should uh, always, uh, perhaps I do at least for a long time, diabetic uh, vitrectomy is a different ball game, yeah. even when we never had the anti-VEGFs to give uh, pre-op. Uh, and so <coughs> whatever you have cleared area, keep on lasering that area. Yeah. Don't wait till the end. You see, this is something which I followed. and. Uh, if you keep on doing that, then even if you have such an eventuality, you are absolutely safe. But most of the time what happens, we are waiting till end. And by that time, the blood is oozing from many places and you have a issue. And uh, as uh, Dr. Vishali said, uh, there's no way. You'll have to remove that blood if there's an underneath break. Maybe you just localize it to that area. You have to take care of that. But if you have taken care of most of the areas as you go along the surgeon, surgical uh, maneuver, I think that works much better. Uh, I just want to ask that uh, if suppose if the clot is in the peripheral retina, like in along the arcades or beyond the arcades, and we know that there is underlying break, can we laser over the clot? Not over the clot, around the clot. No, you, you try to separate it from the surrounding area. And make it small, even if you, uh, even if suppose break is there, yeah, it is break is already matter. there, yeah. so it doesn't matter. Even if you want to clear this clot, but you don't want to laser over it, and you don't want to do that. Because and why it has happened? Because that's what I am saying. You will take care of these things beforehand. If you take beforehand, then you have uh, less challenge. And uh, you can always do in the post-op period also, if there is some laser to be applied. Thank you. Thanks. Sir. Madam, I have a case where uh, all the fibroblastor proliferation has been completely separated, but still the retina is stiff, extending in the superior arcade and splitting the fovea, extending up to the superior fovea, which is splitting. So everything peripheral laser has been done, but that area is not at all setting. It's still stiff. So how to uh, make it uh, settle that stiff retina? I didn't get it. 
saying he's done surgery for TRD and it is getting, uh, taking too long to go back. Have you given tamponade in this case? Yes, sir. Uh, Even what? after oil injection also. There was no break. I mean, how no many, break. How no many break. days it's there, uh, now there? So it's more than one month. More it takes time. Wait, wait for it. It, it will go. It takes about it three will definitely go. The area of the stiff retina which is elevated yes. is above just arcade and splitting the four wheel area. But is it progressing, that no, area? No, not If it. it is not progressing, you should not be bothered. Only concern is if there is a rigmatogenous component which is not taken care of. For that, it's a good idea, like I get my photographs done on Optos to monitor that area of localized stiff retina art pocket of detachment what you are seeing if it is not progressing it will go away sometimes it takes three four five six months to go away if it is progressing then you should be concerned that there is some component which needs to be addressed i think the uh, best is you just keep on doing oct maybe at, at two or three weeks uh, we have these cases where uh, this tractional rectal detachment was so bad, yeah. like it, everything pulled up. It takes otherwise a uh, few months for it to go back. But you will keep on seeing every time that it is going back. And finally it will get back and they will get much better vision also. So that's what uh, Dr. Vishali is also trying to tell you that uh, perhaps you have to be very sure that it is not going reverse. Suppose it is getting worse, that means there is a component of a combined detachment, then you will have no other way except to go back and take care of it. So okay. it should not go in the reverse manner. So intraoperative, do we need to uh, relax the retina to make it settle that stiff retina? Not always. Not if always. you have no breaks, don't create additional breaks. It will go back slowly. You see, even uh, you must have realized, uh, some of you, those who do the surgery routinely, it's not that easy to drain all that stuff. It doesn't come that uh, easy, it doesn't flatten that easily. So you need not do that. If, if you have nicely removed everything, it will definitely go back. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's regarding the, 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 the choice of the temperature. Like your, your topic was on combined, but, but the uh, question is from that uh, only uh, uh, or, or TRD. So if we don't have any break, I don't think that there is we any. You don't have to tamper that. No. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This is what, what I want to say that even if the stiff retina is there, it SRF is, is there, there is no need to yeah. tamper with there the There is no need to tamper with the This is the I, th I think we always say, at least uh, I believe it, the best case is where you have not gone beyond doing a simple vitrectomy. It may be a difficult case. You have not created break, you have not done anything, but you have done other things, including whatever, removal of all your uh, traction, everything, done laser, that is the best case. The second best scenario is where you have just perhaps got, gotten away with a short acting gas. I always say silicone is a bad news in cases of diabetic vitrectomy because they don't do them that well, you see, as such also. So most of the time we tend to avoid, except in very uh, situation where we have no other way, we tend to, so that is the way it goes uh, as far as diabetic vitrectomy is concerned. So thank you very much. It was a very, uh, yeah, you have some question? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, yeah. One question. Uh, in case of this uh, retinal breast combined, this regmatogenesis and this retinal detachment, how we can, what are the weak points to avoid the enlargement of the breaks or what care should be taken how in the way to avoid the enlargement of the, uh, whatever breaks are already there? I think the breaks will enlarge only if you are pulling the overlying membranes vigorously and the retina gets pulled along with it. So the best way is while you are trying to separate the overlying membrane from the break, you have to be very gentle. You can use bimanual dissection if you want. You can use proportional reflex, which is very, very guarded, uh, you know, very controlled, not guarded, in a very controlled manner. But you have to make sure that while you are doing the dissection along the break, you are not causing too much of pull to the underlying retina. That's the only thing. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Shali. I think it was a very interesting uh, discussion uh, part. Uh, and we move on to the next uh, talk uh, by Dr. Amandeep. He's going to talk on the management of retinal detachment, secondary to necrotizing retinitis.
Good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, good morning. Uh, 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 thank you, sir, for this uh, opportunity. So, uh, in this, uh, you know, uh, the IC on the practical pearls of the surgical management of complex retinitis, I'll be t uh, taking care of this necrotizing uh, retinitis and what uh, follows uh, uh, these uh, in these patients. So, what I'm talking about is basically the patient we see this uh, cases of. Uh, acute retinal necrosis and uh, CMV retinitis cases, the, basically the herpetic group and the CMV group, where we see these uh, lots of uh, retinitis and which yield with a lot of, uh, you know, uh, the atrophic spaces. And then that leads, uh, leads to, you know, retinal detachment. And these are, uh, you know, not normal retinal detachments and they uh, demand uh, some other scales and pearls. So what, what you must remember is uh, the RD is happening because of these atrophic spaces there. It's, uh, the, it's called a sieve-like retina, you see, once it starts healing. So this RD can occur late while the lesions are healing. And sometimes the patient is very unlucky and lots of um, the, uh, the things are there in CMV. Lots of retinitis is there. You see the healed part also. You see the active part also. You can see it. And this happens because of the atrophic, you know, holes there. And you have atrophic areas, weak areas. Through that, your SRF goes in and it happens. And it can happen in, due to the vitreous changes also. And these vitreous changes are normally seen in the immunocompetent patient. It will be seen more in ARN patient. So ARN patient, you have inflammation. Inflammation will lead to, you know, vitreous debris and trying to PVD happening. And so the, whenever the PVD is happening, you know, uh, we've been told all these years that the, that the vitreous is firmly attached at the scars. So it will not detach from there. All but it will cause a large tear in the normal, at the edge of the normal and the trophic retina. And the, apart from the trophic area, so this can happen in case of on in the at the edge so the incidence is more in on just because of that because of the atrophic areas and both vitreous changes and cmv only atrophic areas are there you don't see more of you know uh, the uh, vitreous changes so we see less incidence of rd is there uh, in case of uh, cmv patients so before moving on to surgery has there anybody, anybody talked there's a lot of papers but no head-to-head -head trials for the reason because these are not very common things so uh, the Paul Sternberg is a uh, is the greatest uh, you know uh, uh, the guy who propo uh, proposes that you should prophylactically laser these lesions so all this prophylactic of laser came for the ARN patient not for the CMV CMV it came much later so they what they did was they uh, treated these areas of acute retinal necrosis, the tongue-shaped lesion in the periphery. They gave three rows in the normal retina and believed that uh, the probably uh, there will be adhesion between the retina and the choroid and now you're, uh, you know, the, uh, even if the PVD is there, it will not be able to detach the retina. So this is what they thought. But, but again, the other groups uh, showed that it, it was not of much help, but they definitely uh, are convinced that group that it, it helps in their patients. And, but there are no head-to-head -head trials. Again, for the CMV, very uh, uh, minimal uh, studies are there because the CMV is much more extensive. It's very difficult to do prophylactic laser, but it is easy in CMV because on the media is poor because of the vitritis. But the, so you do it little a week later of treating them with uh, cyclovir and steroid. CMV you can do it early. People did it, but not much of use there. So la lack of head to head trial, so I really can't say it works or not works. It is up to you. You have to uh, think and be convinced yourself. I personally do not do a prophylactic laser in these patients. There is an entity called barrage laser. When we talk of a barrage laser, we uh, remember our PG days, there is an RD called subclinical RD, the RD beyond the equator. So if you have a localized RD, localized retinal detachment, and you go locally and do a barrage laser around it and just wish that do it doesn't come down. This is what we have been doing and we do in such cases also. So there is a role of a barrage laser in case of subclinical RDs. So now we move on to the surgeries. What surgeries can we do in them? PPV or a buckle? Definitely, you know, buckle is very, very uh, less. I mean, uh, I have done only maybe in 20 years, but two cases of buckle, where again, a subclinical RD became a clinical one. I took an early decision and did a buckle in that patient and come out worked. But most of the patients will not have a very mild or, uh, you know, quadrantic involvement. The majority will look, uh, require paspin or vitrectomy because there are multiple areas of involvement and you will see the posterior breaks because by the time the patient comes to you so everything is now circumferentially going towards the, the all these lesions love the foveal center they have a tendency to you know take a walk towards the disc and the foveal center and burn everything out so everything happens in the posterior pole 
So PPV is a good choice. So whenever you're doing PPV in these patients now, you need a thorough debulking. You know, you need to have a debulking there. You will find most of the times a PVD in on, but you will not find PVD in CMV retinitis there. In CMV retinitis, you will see a typical vitreous kind of a picture, and you will have try to induce PVD. You try to lift it from the normal retina to the atrophic retina fast. You know, do it quick PVD, very dangerous. Never do a quick PVD in, even in an RD surgery or any surgery because uh, the, uh, you've been taught if God asks you which PVD I want, I, I don't want acute PVD, I want chronic PVD. Because the chances of having breaks in acute PVD are more. So similarly to our patients, we should not give them acute PVD. We should give them slow PVD because we may not cause the hydrogenic breaks there. So in these patients, it's the important to do a slow PVD there. We'll not be able to attach the detach the, you know, uh, the vitreous beyond the margin of the normal and abnormal. Abnormal right now, you will not be able, the lattice, you remember, you can't go beyond it. You have to go around it. Go around it. So similarly, you, here you can't go around it because it is up to the aura. So kind of, it's easy. Remove it towards, towards the end and then do thorough shave debulking. Debulking is very important in these patients. So don't go for overkill here because it's going to harm the patients. Lensect me or not. When we started, uh, the Dr. Freeman, Dr. Dr. Blue Marquez, uh, they are the names which started all these procedures and they are the names and the 1890s the papers are too good to I mean, uh, believe. They used to do lensectomy at that time because they used to put uh, gases in these eyes at that time. So they felt that uh, 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 putting a gas needed a thorough vitrectomy and the concept of using oil was not there. So they used to do lensectomy. But nowadays we don't do a lensectomy in them. And because we know that good vitrectomy is possible with the good systems there, and we have oil to take care of the multiple small, small holes, and good visual rehabilitation is possible in these patients. I'll tell you why. Because at that time, you know, this AIDS patient was surviving only for one year. They were doing a palliative surgery at that time in 80 years, 90. Now these patients are surviving. I have a patient who has a follow-up of 13 years even. Okay, so you can't just do a lensectomy. How will I, you know, rehabilitate him? So uh, good surgeons are doing a you know, keeping the lenses, they are even doing cataract surgery and IOL before putting the oil. There's so many things you can do. Do not need to check me here. Buckle or not buckle, okay. No buckle, okay, like Dr. Lingam Gopal said, choroid, uh, the coloboma, no buckle because it is inferior here. The buckle is not required here because the most of the things are happening, you know, post posteriorly in the posterior pole. So where the buckle is required, I have written there an inferior RD now. If you have an RD which is going inferiorly and a break there inferiorly, because the, in an oil, you remember, there is an arc of contact. Whichever oil you may put, except for densirons and all that, you, you can't take care of the you know, inferior six or lock, lock area because the most of the time we are standing, sitting. and So that area is have a subclinical RD is there. Your macula is on, but that thing is off. Again, you are not doing a palliative surgery. You want a long-term outcome. So you put a buckle in patients. You see a, a trophic inferior RD with a break. But if you see a atrophic area, no break going in that area, no need to laser, the, uh, uh, sorry, the, put a buckle in these patients. Air fluid exchange. Most of the time, you will have pre-existing areas there. You will see the break there. You will see the atrophic areas that are lifted. You can drain through them. So sometimes you have to make a retinotomy because you may not find a proper plane there. But retinotomy, take care. Don't make, ever make a retinotomy in the active lesion, active uh, area. If you may make an active, uh, you know, disease is there, you make a retinotomy there, you'll, uh, it's, it's, not a, it's not a good thing to do. You can have a bleeder there, you can have anything, and the healing takes a little long there. How much laser, you know? The laser is again, the, again, the uh, 80s and 90s, the people, we are following the same standard except for one point I've written. You do, you know, a triple row photocoagulation around the lesions. The good thing is it is going to the aura serrata, so you have to do it posteriorly. If it is not going to the aura serrata, then just go around it and do it, okay? And in case you find a, you know, any, because these diseases have vasculitis also. If you see a, any evidence of hemorrhage there, any evidence of NVD, NV there, then you have to go for a full scatter laser in these patients in the, in the normal retina also. They've been lasering the areas of the atrophic retina because they were putting gases at that time because they were not sure where is the micro micro holes are because but they are not taking any they don't take any you know uh, uh, you know uh, kind of if you, if you can't treat over the coloboma same way putting a scar over here you will see a faint burn so in the or era of oil this thing is uh, you're redundant you don't need a pexy there over the atrophic areas oil versus gas again 
again gas in 80s soon the concept of oil started because there was an increased success oil was uh, gas was successful in the second case the oil was successful in the first attempt so the first anatomical success is very important that is more for visual outcome second anatomical success is less visual outcome you must remember that so these patients will not you will not be able to give you know buckle there because you can put oil reduce retinopexy more oil so these are good cases but sometimes you may have a patient which you have a subtotal rd you know we have a superior break you have uh, you know uh, disease has been well, uh, well controlled and because you know we see lots of cmv retinitis patients after organ transplant they are not as fulminant as aids patients the kids with the leukemias and uh, lymphomas they are not as fulminant they have a, you know less cmv retinitis because the viral load is not that high they are not hiv patients they are immunocompromised patient due to other reasons like organ transplant and aller diseases so there you have a superior kind of a rd or a superior break you can do a good vitrectomy in them put a long acting gas or a short acting depending on the you know the, the patient's ability to lie and maintain the position the oil there you know uh, uh, this is what dr lingongopal uh, has been saying that the th 1000 cc or a 13 uh, 100 cc oil is sufficient in these patients you don't have to give for 5000 cc so my uh, my tip for using 5000 in a one eyed patient is there i use 5000 cc and again this is my uh, you know uh, believe but i uh, i uh, people have not compared 1000 versus 5000 i have seen uh, you know uh, uh, in last 20 years and operated more than you know 50 uh, 60 eyes of uh, you know hiv patients i see that if i put a 1000 cc in an active disease you know it it, it somehow it emulsifies more it throws up a reaction because you have to believe that uh, you know the, they are uh, the the medicine guys are uh, able to save them they are on heart now they they they'll have inflammation so they will have more uh, reaction with the 1000 cc more of debris there more emulsification so i use active disease 5000 cc i can continue just just, just i think 5 minutes more so uh, red attachment rates with the oil there in meticulous ppb more than 90% success is there but you must remember the the, the game is not over here because rrd is there and these patients the hypotony is there hypotony is going to be the real challenge in these patients because there is a lot of retina already been killed and the the disease is moving on to the you know ciliary body also you they have hypotonic eye you always in a dilemma whether to remove oil or not i mean there are so many unanswered questions there again the iru problems you must remember that these eyes have will develop cme and erm under oil i have operated these patient who under the oil now because they are surviving their cd4s have gone to beyond 600 700 900 they are developing these erms developing these uh, you know uh, the debris over the iols and you have to again and again go and do a yag in these patients because somehow they will uh, because of the immune recovery is you know building up then there is the oil there in these eyes and of course the visual recovery though little but it all depends how soon you have you know uh, op op operated or how less severe the disease was if there is optic nerve involved because the optic neuropathy is the major killer here in the moment the optic nerve is involved because optic nerve the an is a basically a vasculitis you know it it kills the retinal vessels and the optic uh, uh, you know uh, disc vessels that's why we give aspirin and we add you know the steroids in these patients so the optic neuropathy is there again the foveal center is involved so visual recovery is less actually these patients i have two short videos there uh, just for 30 30 seconds and this is the one patient you, you see this temporal large breaks in the schlaren there and this is this is the large break from this fluid is coming so uh, the uh, you see the foveal center is also involved we are just doing this surgery because the other the periphery is all right there is one pvr and of course we've been taught that you will not see pvr in these patients cmv patient because with the advent of heart with the immune recovery you will see pvr also in uh, these patients so if you delay the surgery they will have a bad proliferative retinopathy in these patients because their immune system is improving so this is again you have to do a standard uh, so this this patient i said because i didn't put oil in this patient i did this uh, gas tamponade in this patient this is another one this this is just wanted to show that this is the you know the atrophic and the normal retina the space between that and you see this active margin here you know this this is all this is atrophic this is active and uh, i i created a retinotomy in the you know in in, in, the, in the normal retina there and then uh, this is this is how you go all around 
and, and, and laser the margins. You don't have to go uh, over these. If this is a retinotomy here I've created and just all around and uh, give, a, give a oil, oil in these patients. It's again a, a, a fake eye. So the carry home tips are, you know, I've already said uh, this is no longer a palliative surgery because these patients are not going to survive for a one year or two year. They are going to, you're going to see them for another uh, 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 touch wood, uh, 15, 20 years, okay? The challenge is for us, for the eye surgeon is because they are surviving but not able to see. The challenge is all on us now because they'll be coming to your clinic again and again, again and again, again and again, and that'll, that you will not feel happy about it. So the good meticulous PPV with oil tamponade with additional buckle with required is, uh, is a key to the, this thing. But the reattachment is not the end of the road, it's just to start there. Thank you so much for your patience. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mandeep, for uh, tackling something which perhaps uh, most, and especially a challenge, challenging situation which he talked about, that these patients are surviving. So we were not even uh, being aggressive in past, and there is no choice. And uh, once there is no choice, and then even recurrence happening under the oil. So so many things he talked about, which in fact we were not even knowing uh, a few years back. And uh, any questions to Dr. Raman, please? see uh, there is no prophylactic PPV for them. The RD is done, uh, the retinal detachment is done, surgery is done whenever the RD is there. So even if the antiviral has been given for three days, you know, if the RD is there, I'll operate them. Because now the thing is, the good thing is, you know, there are two things there. The, once you have a retinal detachment there, you will put oil, oil will somehow, it will have anti-inflammatory action. It will take care of the disease also, but you will continue your antiviral. But it's not like that you give antiviral for seven days, only then I'll operate. It's not like that. People have even used, you know, during the surgery, you know, in the infusion, they put acyclovir, but uh, that works or not, doesn't work. The question is, as soon as the RD is there, you plan your surgery. Because, sir, in active disease, uh, there is a more chance of inducing hydrogenic breaks. But th th like I said, I mean, don't go for the, uh, you know, you are not going to lift the, you know, vitreous over. If you're going to lift the vitreous over the, uh, you know, active area, it is going to cause a break. But you don't go for that. Don't have to go near it and just go till that edge and then you laser. Because I told you the PVR is going to happen. The, 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 it, will, it will worsen right in front of your eyes. Because once the RD is there, you, I mean, in a CLV patient, you can't even give the intravitreal to him. Okay. In an ARN patient, you can give the, you know, this thing. Because the, most of the patients will not have uh, access to the, uh, you know, Valgan. It's a costly drug. Okay. So no option for these patients just to operate them. Because earlier you operate, Better are the results. Thank you, sir. A any other? Uh, okay, then we will move on uh, with the next talk. Uh, Our uh, last talk of the IC today is by the Chief Instructor, Dr. Dogra, who will be talking about management of recurrent RDs with PVR. Uh, this was first talk otherwise. patient is not affording van Gan cyclovir, which medicine you give for these patients? I will say again, please. 
if patient is not affording well gancyclovir in which medicine you will advise you know uh, in, in hiv patients uh, the uh, the treatment is basically uh, uh, started with the gancyclovir there okay so the gancyclovir is the drug which is uh, 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 you know given to the patient the iv route and the intravitreal route so valgan came into being because of the better bioavailability uh, bio and the, the the it's available in the tablet form you know and 900 mg bd but uh, again it is not available uh, as a injectable form again so if the valgan is not available or the patient is not affording that so we have to come back to the gancyclovir so you have to give gancyclovir intravitreally also and the intravenous also so the gancyclovir is a drug because the government of india in our A art centers provides the free of cost uh, you know the gancyclovir only depending on the availability it all depends on the availability you know the there's a big issue here i don't want to start that story because the the um, the hard drugs are very commonly available but the opportunistic infection drugs are not available in various art centers uh, in, in uh, we have a art center in our tertiary care center uh, so it's, it's a big issue with these patients actually again in the west the because the incidence has gone down the cmv rate nitrous because they are uh, they are not virtually uh, seeing very less number of patients but there they used to give this uh, gancyclovir implant in these patients Whatever few HIV patients that I'm seeing with uh, CMV retinitis, uh, they uh, are started on heart. But as you said, that gancyclovir is not available for systemic uh, this thing, and uh, for IV also some of them are not affording. So we are just treating them with intravitreal gancyclovir, and heart goes on. But their systemic issue is there. So what do we? Samandar, uh, it's it's a, it's a very good. You are treating them with intravitreal, so that is important actually, because. Uh, Uh, CMV retinitis is not ocular disease. It, it can happen to, uh, if it's there in the eye. That means it's there in the system also. Yeah. Ideally, they should be given uh, intravenous also. also. But uh, you know, the, you can always tell the patient, you know, because uh, uh, if you if you are able to get the intravitreous injection, so you should be able to get the intravenous also. Yes. So you should treat them with intravenous, so at least for the first 15 days, and then the induction, maintenance, and that course. uh sorry for the hiccup here uh i did load uh, in the other room but uh, so we just going to talk about uh, of course uh, this is such a subject which is uh, quite uh, exhaustive uh, but we, uh, as far as the pvr is concerned some of you those who are already in the practice you see uh, we know that this is something which would happen in 5 to 10% of all cases but the biggest problem is this is the commonest cause of re redetachment uh, in about 50 to 75% of the cases and uh, basically what is happening here is that you have these cellular membranes which are growing within the vitreous cavity and on both surfaces of the retina and pvr as i already said is the major cause of a anatomical and a visual failure after uh, when we do a surgery for uh, retinal detachment usually it would happen 4 to 12 weeks after surgery we tell most of the patient i think you may be good if you are good for 3 months in most situation and must consult that it's very important to tell that and pvr most frequently starts in the inferior quadrant first and that is where you usually have because of the gravity these settle, cells settle down like here Uh, down this retina would become stiff this edge may start elevating up and the rest of retina may be st still mobile and what you see in the early pvr cases is a white opacification retinal surface the uh, edge of the retinal break may be rolled and you may, you may have suddenly that this retina is no more much mobile but 
little stiffer. And of course, fixed folds and funnel detachment are very clear cut, like this. You get more of these wrinkling, and the rest retina is not that much wide. So already the process is on, and the edges of the brakes are rolled. Or you have much more pronounced like this. I mean, you already have, now the retina has got a lot of fixed folds. It has got almost uh, uh, totally into uh, that kind of a. So basically, I'm not talking about uh, much about the classification. And we know that uh, there are two ways to classify it. In early stage, just a vitreous haze, pigments, a lot of pigments you find, uh, especially in the gear retina. Uh, so this is what was called uh, usually as A. We still use it. And in B, you have uh, what I have shown you just now, stiffness of retina, more wrinkling. These uh, break or the edge would have rolled edges. And then C, you start seeing these uh, full thickness retinal folds in one quadrant, two quadrant, three quadrants. That's the way you divide it. And the D would be when the fixed folds are all in the four quadrants, either it is an open uh, or a narrow or a closed funnel like this. This is one of the cases. I think this is Raman's case, perhaps. This is a CMV case or something. And you may have configuration like this or like this. Closed funnel. The, even the optic disc is not seen. Everything, I, I'll show you subsequently, surgery on this very patient uh, uh, later on. And the revised uh, classification, which became suddenly, uh, which was uh, subsequently put, because the anterior proliferative vitreo retinopathy was not addressed at all in the previous classification. So that's how, uh, so, so same, in the beginning it is same, but then that is the way it is divided, CP 1 to 12. That means it, this is posterior to the equator, either you have a focal, diffuse or circumferential full thickness folds. And there may be subretinal bands. And if the similar thing is happening, anterior to the equator, which may be again focal, diffuse or circumferential with full thickness folds, and you have condensed vitreous, then of course uh, that is anterior PVR. So this was addressed subsequently. Still, most of you, we use uh, the older thing, and that is the way we tend to. And so you can see here, the retina has totally gone very stiff. You have these uh, uh, fixed folds, and the retina is getting pulled towards the optic disc. So what are the risk factors, basically? What should we take? If you have a multiple large uh, tears or a giant tear, you should be very careful. You have to be more meticulous. These are the cases. Or a retinal detachment with choroidal detachment. Most of the time, many a time, our own, you see, uh, resident, senior resident, even fellow colleagues sometimes say, why you have to kind of be more aggressive, even use a oil in most of the cases with choroidal detachment. Because that is where the problem is. They proliferate. So that is where the issue is. Or you have a vitreous hemorrhage. Again, it's just tumulus. You have an inflammatory eye. Already Raman has uh, talked about that. And long untreated retinal detachment or following posterior penetrating trauma. These are all. So if you have a giant tear like this, you have to be very careful. You may land up with PVR, so you need to be. Uh, so what are the risk factor in an operated eye? That is what we are interested in. Can we take care of that? Previous RD surgery, especially multiple surgeries. So if you have a preoperative PVR already, then there are chances, because it was an old attachment, patient game, which is not uh, uncommon in our country, and failure to remove all tractions from the retina. This is the biggest cause. You need to, whatever way, go for that hyaloid. It may be the most difficult thing, but posteriorly, as you remove, you may not remove all the way. You may come up to some level, maybe near the equator or something, but once you have done that, I think your job is uh, then done. And failure to, of course, failure to clo close all the breaks, or you have done retinectomy, or heavy cryotherapy, or it is a, a sort of a inflammatory eye, then the, these are the problem. So this is something in a case where buckling was done, which failed, and you have a retina like this. And so as far as the treatment is concerned, mostly sterile buckling provides good outcome and is still indicated from PVR B up to PVR B or even C1, C2 and stage C onward, C3 onwards, which I mentioned earlier, you require most of the time a vitrectomy. 
the goals of surgery are similar. You would want to close all the retinal break, relax the vitreoretinal adhesion, and of course they are achieved with greater difficulty. We'll uh, come to that. And early stages of RD with PVR is managed with, especially in scleral buckling, uh, in a uh, in a fakey guys, especially in children. Go for buckling, even if you have extensive proliferation. Many a time it works. So. And the PV, PPV would be indicated uh, in eyes with fakia, pseudophakia. You have large posterior breaks or no evident breaks or already a failed buckle. And so what do you do? After meticulous vitrectomy, you need to remove all the membrane. I think I'll demonstrate some of these things here. So what, what you need to do is you have to go and remove all the membranes. If you remove that, you are in a good shape. Maybe you can see underneath there already there's a plug and it is sort of vascularized and you'll see a suddenly there's a bleed uh, in that very area and which goes subretinally. So sometimes you have uh, all kind of challenges in, in, in these situations and uh, so and you can see now that this very blood it would usually come out and uh, but this can happen and uh, you need to remove all these fixed folds. If you don't remove, it's going to come back, it's going to fail. So that is what happens. So once you have nicely removed and picked up uh, all the uh, uh, membranes from these fixed folds, so you'll be in a much better shape. So now you can see here that fold, uh, of course, uh, uh, becomes much better. and. Uh, through the same one which you created, uh, you can settle such a retina. So this is uh, another case here, the same case I had shown you. So if you remove these kind of folds, you may have uh, good results. What about sphere cases? That is where the real challenge is. So you have to perhaps do here everything. And that is what perhaps would be demonstrated here. And most of the time, you require a perfluorocarbon as a third hand here. So this would help you to partly flatten the retina. You can remove these membranes and stabilize it behind. And that is how you, you keep on going. And if you have a shortened retina, as I mentioned earlier, you may have to do a retinectomy or a retinotomy. And maybe, sometimes, rarely, very rarely, I hate this 360 degree. I think they do very badly. So most of that, that is some once in a uh, while you have to do that. And tamponade, most of the time you use either a long-acting gas or a oil in such a situation, if it is a sphere case. Like this uh, here, most of the time in sphere cases, we put a 240 band. And that's very important because they have uh, anteriorly uh, so much of proliferation which you are not able to remove. And this is the case which I had shown, that closed funnel. Now you see it is just like a plaster. You will not even look at this eye. But we, I had to look at this eye. This, had, this child, I still remember, uh, was brought with great difficulty, very poor. Other eye was thysical. So you have no choice. You have to go in. And uh, now look at this retina, maybe detached for, we don't know how long. These are such stiff folds uh, that you have to now use the PFCL and keep on removing layer by layer. Keep on doing. You may be there forever almost. And once you remove that, you find more space, inject little more PFCL. So keep on going. You see, it's, it's kind of getting somewhere there, which in fact, to me, I had told them, I am going to mercenary surgery. Maybe it doesn't work at all. Uh, the lens also was having a cataract posterior subcapsular, and this is the giant here, which was so stiff, it was standing like, like a stiff retina there. But despite all this, you can see now the retina has fairly uh, gone back, and keep on removing as much as you can without doing damage. That is very important. If you can keep on removing some of these folds or the, these epiretinal membranes which are sticky there, and then you do the laser. In such a situation, you would laser all around because you have done such extensive surgery and there's a PVR. And 
here this particular giant ear, I couldn't do, the laser couldn't come there. I had to cryo because it was still standing like a stiff thing up. So that's how uh, uh, this thing was cryo and subsequently the silicon oil was injected in this eye. I think that is the giant ear, this is the case, closed funnel. It uh, became something like this, you see, under the oil. And once the oil was removed, this child, it's amazing, he became ambulatory. And still you could, uh, despite doing such a extensive surgery, one could uh, get, uh, I would say, fairly good visual in, a, in a absolutely a blind child. So functional and anatomic outcome are dependent on the severity of the disease. Posterior PVR is easily visualized and can be completely removed. Problem is anterior PVR. I'm not even, I had another case, but I'm not showing you. This is another gentleman who was operated elsewhere. Everything contracted after the buckle and uh, very apprehensive, but somehow some patients are lucky. Yeah, look, he got something like 612. And, uh, but usually prognosis is not that great. You have to consult them beforehand. As anatomical success may be 60 to 80 percent, the functional is much poorer. So most of them may just get less than 660 vision. That is what you have to consult them. And the single procedure has a 60 percent chances of achieving, maybe, again, it is less than 660. And compared to the multiple, if you do multiple surgery, they do even much worse. So basically for prevention is very important. So for recurrent RD, remove all the traction from the retina before. Support the residual traction with skeletal buckle. I think Dr. Raman mentioned that. Inferiorly many a time you are not able to remove. You have a contracted retina, put a buckle. You will be much safer later on. And close all retinal breaks. So don't leave anything. And use minimum cryo. And use of long term tamponade is very, very important. So recent trend is, as I said, you perform skeletal buckling in fakey eyes with moderate PVR, and especially in children. And small gauge vitrectomy or hybrid vitrectomy, sometimes you need, and complete membrane peeling is essential. And the PFCL in a severe case would be required as a third end. Anterior vitreous based resection with lens or eye oil removal may also be necessitated. We have cases where the whole of the peripheral retina is stuck to the iris and use retinectomy and retinectomy rarely and long-term long tamponade is very essential. So in conclusion, PVR membrane proliferates and contract on retinal and vitreal surfaces. The clinical diagnosis depend on the pattern of distortion and the PVR surgery require often a, a pastoral vitrectomy with various modifications you have to use. And anatomical Outcome has improved, but the visual outcome still remains poor, but you have to try and it's consult these patients very well. That is what is very important. So thank you very much. Friends. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. My question is uh, the child, the RD. Didn't the retina flatten without the need for retinectomy? Which the, one? The one, the last case, the child with the PVR. No, uh, yeah, I didn't do retinectomy in that. And it flattened like it that? It flattened. Though it was very stiff. The retina, even if it is stiff, that is what we have to. Hmm. If we are able to remove those membranes, so what happens once you remove all those membranes and slowly keep on injecting, don't go in one go, uh, perfluorocarbon liquid, you will find that the retina has gone back uh, nicely. So that is what happened. And the peripheral retina, which was still very stiff, was yeah. supported on this band which we put in the beginning. So that is essential in such a case, that you need to put a band. Otherwise, uh, the retina in the periphery, you can't remove all the tractions because there will be still uh, some areas where even the giant ear here, it was uh, not going back despite we have removed because it stayed there for so long that's why the cryo was done. Otherwise, we would not have. But finally, after cryo, after uh, we have done meticulous uh, surgery, uh, that also flattened over the uh, band in this post-op period. Okay. Um, yeah. um, my second question, if I don't have, uh, I don't have experience in scleral buckling, I do vitrectomy only. So uh, in this case, uh, I would have done like retinectomy to flatten the retina. Uh, 
but the problem is that sometimes when the PVR is very extensive and interior, we have to do like 280, almost three, uh, yeah, 300 degrees yeah. retinectomy. But the problem is that when you do that, the uh, exchange, the retina get wrinkled to the posterior pole and uh, slippage occurs. How can I avoid the slippage? You see, uh, most of the time, I am one person who hates doing that. I may be doing one such case in maybe a year, 360 degree. Because 360 degree is a bad, uh, this thing. That's how we believe that you put a band, it would support, and you only do limited to an area where it is still short. Mm -hmm. And the, your, uh, either air is going behind or even your PFC is tend to go behind, you do in that area. If you follow that, it's much better. Otherwise, in such a situation, again, if you are planned to do, then you will have to remove these membranes both anteriorly and posteriorly. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there are thick membranes posteriorly also. Because once you have done 360 degree, you have created a 360 degree giant tear. Mm -hmm. So you can't, and one, once with the PFCL it has gone back, I still don't do direct PFCL oil exchange. I feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So you just keep that edge dry, keep your silicone tip there, and do the exchange. Most of the time it will not slip if you have removed the membranes from both the surfaces. Hmm. But try to avoid doing 360 degree. Not Sometimes a it's these very cases, expensive. These it's cases, not at all. Yeah, that's what mm -hmm. I'm saying. Mm -hmm. If you do, you saw this was a bad case. This looked like as if the retina is like a plastered retina. Mm -hmm. It does work. It does work. I can tell you that. I, I just uh, somehow I feel not a great. Uh, and mostly I have not seen whatever few cases I've done that they recover any vision, these patients with 360 degree uh, <laughs> retinectomy or uh, what we do. Yeah. And if there is a recurrent RD, it is better to do the revision surgery under silicon oil or remove the silicon yes. oil? Yes, I do. think you could do both ways. First mm -hmm. you do under the oil mm -hmm. because you see these membranes very well and that also serve you a little uh, sort of a, a counter traction to you and you remove these membranes, they'll come out very nicely under the oil. And that is also uh, we do often. But whatever has now not, you're not able to remove, then we do remove oil in most of them. We re-inject the oil later. Re because you can do the residual membrane uh, dissection also. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think our time is almost over. Yeah, so quick, one quick, quick question. Uh, this yeah. is regarding a case of uh, buckle huh. in a 74-year-old uh, pseudophagic male. Uh, it's a superior RRD with uh, a tear and PBRB changes. Uh, I thought I could get away with buckle, done a successful buckle. On table, the tear got on the buckle and cryoed it well. Uh, but the next day, probably because of excessive cryo, I suppose I had a choroidal detachment, not on table, off table next day, and there was fish mouthing. Then I waited patiently because I know I have cryoed it well and it's put on the buckle, the choroidal will settle. And 15 days later, it got settled and everything was over the buckle. Then I started noticing vitreous exudates. And I thought it is plumb infection. I washed it closely, gave intravitreal antibiotics. Uh, it is. It was responding two days later. I repeated. It was responding, but one week later, presented with lot of vitreous exudates, and I have seen inferior RD coming up also. So I've done a uh, pass plana vitrectomy with silicone oil. Uh, at the end, I thought it is wise. Everything was well done on the table. But my question here is whether uh, should I have removed the plumb also before undertaking the patient for vitrectomy? Uh, I think in such a situation where you have a definite evidence of a intraocular infection. Uh, in such situation, we do have to remove that. Because if we don't remove it, I have had such cases coming to me from other uh, surgeons sometimes, and it's kind of a panicky situation. So you have to remove that. Uh, Long in, before, in, before yes, undertaking yes. for vitrectomy. Yes. And, I've and at the end, uh, I've injected, despite having silicone oil, after I've closed everything, I've injected intra one-tenth dose of intraocular antibiotics again because there's a pocket of air. Yeah. It's not a complete uh, oil, air, uh, yeah. air oil exchange. Yeah. So one-tenth dose of intraocular antibiotics is still advocated. Though yeah, half a dose you can give all the time. There's no after problem. oil, after oil. After oil also one-fourth they say, but uh, there's no harm. Uh, uh, you, uh, you can give like maybe, uh, it has to be less than half. Mostly one-fourth uh, it is advocated, but I don't know how much or where it goes. Uh, once you have a oil, that's what that's, uh, the that's question remains with the oil. So should now I go in the post-op period now, a week later, should I go and remove the plumb? I think if it is, 
that's from where the whole infection has come. So you will have to ultimately remove that. That's the that probable yes, source. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Question regarding your choice of uh, instrumentation, uh, choice of instrument to removing the peripheral PVR membranes, the, uh, either the grease haber ILM forcep or the steel facilitated forcep. What do you find more comfortable? I think I tend to go between both, oh. because the problem is you don't know which one holds the better. Mm -hmm. So uh, we tend to switch over. Switch over. So whatever is holding better, that is what we use. Oh. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all of you.